Hello and welcome to this review of my Micro Switch Magnetic Read Keyboard. The catalogue number is 53RW4-1, but that's not really saying much, is it? I unboxed this thing a while ago, and it's a really cool board. As you can see from the model sticker, it was made in 1970, making it the oldest keyboard in my collection. It's half a century old. That's one and a half times as old as I am. The extreme age of the keyboard was necessary in order to show you the switches that it uses, which were quickly replaced by their much more well-known Hall Effect brothers, which would be Microswitch's hallmark during the early 70s, all the way through the 90s. But these magnetic reed switches were what they used before they went on that long-running streak. The switch was introduced in 1966, making them one of the earliest keyboard switches we know of. Micro Switch's own designation for them always started with 7A1. The versions in this keyboard are marked 7A1M-X14. This probably denotes some variation between the switches. I don't know what they mean precisely, but they'll probably include things like spring weight. You'll note the switches themselves also include a production date from 1970. I wish more companies would have done that. I've shown several magnetic reed switch keyboards from other manufacturers already, but MSMR, as I abbreviate them, are the oldest magnetic reed keyboard switch that I know of. I should stress though that mag reeds were not a new technology at the time, they were invented in the 1930s by Bell Laboratories and had been in use in telecommunication systems for decades before making it into keyboards. This is what they look like loose. I have a few new old stock samples that I procured years ago in preparation of this video. They're very tall switches. These ones are 7A1H-X55 type from as late as 1982. They're 13 part switches, if you count the reed as a single part, making them one of the most intricate switches known. Compare them to Cherry MX at six base parts and Alps SKCL at 10. There's a lot going on here, especially considering how simple the actual operating principle of the switch is. They're very tall, not counting the mounting pin or contacts, they're 36.9 millimeters, or in imperial units, 36.9 25.4 inches as per the legal definition of the inch, and the keycap doesn't partially go into the switch either when depressed, so the total height from the top of the PCB to the top of the keycaps is around 5 centimeters, and that's without even having a case around it. Good old 70s ergonomics. You'll note that these switches have a very different mount from MS Hall Effect switches as well. Instead of a tall block mount, it's a pin mount, even though the keycap still maintained compatibility with both. Presumably, at this time, the SW series had already been introduced. To achieve the dual mount compatibility, they used a metal insert pin that slides into the keycaps like this. Later keycaps omitted the slots for the metal pins, but by 1970s decision data 8010 still used them, for example. I'm guessing they just kept putting them in until their original molds wore out or something. They're extremely nice keycaps. They have little to no texture on them, but they're massively thick double shot ABS with spherical key tops and they look beautiful. Fujitsu's keycaps were slightly thicker at three full millimeters rather than just below it, but those are more fragile because of the ridiculously tight mount Fujitsu used, whereas these micro switch caps appear to be virtually indestructible. They're possibly the best keycaps ever made. This is what the switches look like on the inside. Essentially, there's a magnet in this fucking huge red slider here, which moves past the reed contact when the slider is pressed. The reed itself is a set of open contacts sealed in a glass bubble filled with inert gas. The proximity of the magnet causes magnetization of the contacts, which are then attracted to each other, closing the circuit and registering a key press. The advantage of encasing the contacts in an inert atmosphere is that by doing so, you get negligible oxidation of the contacts when the circuit closes, as there is no oxygen present to do so. Contact oxidation is what normally eventually causes a switch to stop registering reliably over time. And for anyone who's wondering, the movement of the contact itself doesn't wear them out because the motion is below that of the fatigue limit. Furthermore, the advantage of using a magnet is that the switch becomes contactless, which considerably enhances its potential for smoothness. This is also why I've been such a proponent for contactless modern switch alternatives that employ Hall Effect or optoelectric switches.
Now these are definitely smooth, there is almost nothing in the way of scratchiness, which, considering it's fucking 50 years old, Jesus hopscotch in Christ, is quite impressive. Of course, you'll want me to compare it to their Hall Effect switches now, of which I also have a new old stock keyboard as it happens, this Univac Sperry Rand keyboard. Now, the two are both quite good, but they feel a bit different. The mag reads are smoother on straight down key presses, but there is a little bit of binding present, which is less so on the Hall Effect ones. It's not terrible binding, not like keys are getting stuck or anything, but it's more than what's present on the Univac, which is virtually none. The switches are also quite stiff, which was a pretty common thing back in those days. I can't really use the unit in this condition, obviously, so I didn't get a feel for it in day-to-day -day use, but I suspect I'd find the switches quite tiring to use. They are very satisfying to press though, even if just for that massive clack. By the way, the squeaky noise is the contact opening, it's not switch friction. The unit weighs 915 grams, or in Imperial units, 915 453.59237th pound as per the legal definition of the pound. Not bad for what's basically a 65% keyboard. Even without a case, it's therefore a bit under twice as heavy as a HHKB. In case you're wondering where it went, this is a drop-in replacement module for a monoblock computer, i.e. a computer with a keyboard integrated into the main unit, so it has no case of its own. It will have connected via this very long set of traces, which must have slotted into some giant bus connector on the computer side. From the shape of the traces, it's easy to see that someone laid out the pattern by hand, which was pretty common at the time. Now, if you're wondering why there are so many trace ends in the connector, there is barely anything in the way of a matrix, so every switch almost has its own trace. So the board is actually brainless, it has no integrated circuits to process its own signals. It just passes them onto the computer, which then turns it into key presses. I guess this also makes it relatively easy to convert. Provided I can find a 34.5 cm 71 port slide on bus connector for it, of course. Rather typical for a micro switch board, it uses these upstanding edges here as screw bases to fasten the module to the computer unit, and between each row of keys is a rail that the switches grab onto via these blocks, which are fastened to the switch via a pair of long screws. It's basically micro switches' version of a mounting plate. They used a simplified version of this system for the SW Hall Effect switch series as well. The keyboard has a rather small form factor, roughly analogous to a 65% keyboard, as I mentioned before. Although the layout is completely different, it'll be quite alien to most of us, actually. There is no number row. Instead, it's integrated as a numpad into the alpha block, with a lighter shade of grey to indicate this. I suppose you could access them with this num key over here. The number row instead houses a bunch of symbol and command keys, and to the right of that are some more weird command keys that I have no idea what they are or what they do. There's no control, alt, shift, or even enter or return keys that I can make out, so I think using this thing would be very foreign. I can't even imagine how the operating system this computer came with would work. At the time, computing hadn't become all that widespread yet, so layouts weren't really standardized like they are today, hence why most keyboards from the 70s look quite different from each other. I'd say just about the earliest truly widely adopted keyboard standard was that of the IBM 5150 personal computer, which is known as the XT layout, which was promptly adopted by everyone and their dog, except for Apple, who of course don't like standardization. Although many people associate vintage keyboards with extremely large form factors, such as the IBM F122 Battleship, which is this piece of work here, really, really old keyboards like this tended to have much smaller forms, closer to those found on typewriters, which were still very common at the time anyway, so naturally they made keyboards in their image to make them easier to adapt to. Also, their functionality was closer to a typewriter than later computers would become. 
Overall, it's a really cool keyboard, and if it wasn't so expensive to make custom cases for things like this, I'd love to give it some new life, as I'm sure it still works perfectly like it would if it had been opened 50 years ago. It came from a time where compromises in keyboard manufacturing was a completely foreign concept. Everything at the time was built to last practically forever. I have a whole bunch of keyboards, really, that deserve a second life, in my opinion. It's just a shame that it's so difficult, time-consuming, and expensive. Expensive. That's it for this review. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. And following is a typing demonstration of me typing on this keyboard.